guys, it's Erin, and today I'm going to do a wrap up what I'm reading now kind of video thing. So today I'm going to share with you two books that I read in February that I really liked, two books that I am in the middle of and really enjoying, and two or maybe three books that I would like to read in March. So unfortunately, <laughs> I left the two books that I read in February that I want to talk about at my office at school um, because honestly, most of the books that I was finishing in February were for school. I was had lots of grand reading plans, but then I got busy reading Locke's essay concerning human understanding and a boatload of Shakespeare and other early modern plays and while I enjoy that kind of stuff, it uh, takes up my reading time and my brain space. So didn't get to as many books as I wanted, which is the story of my life during school. I really like should lower my expectations, but hope springs eternal. I wanted to talk about two of those books that I read for school because I just really enjoyed them on a kind of personal level and they're ones that I think I will pick up again just to read for fun. The first one of these is Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. This was written in the 1680s, I'm pretty sure, and it is a highly allegorical novel that explains the journey of Christian from the city of destruction to the celestial city. There's not a ton of nuance in this book. Uh, he meets things like the dragon Apollyon and he goes through the valley of, or he meets the giant despair and he goes through the slough of despond and he visits the house of hope and his companions have names like hopeful and evangelist. Um, but it's not supposed to be like this incredibly subtle nuanced thing, but a more kind of overt uh, didactic kind of book. And I feel like Bunyan did a really great job of balancing the kind of instruction in the Christian life with like an entertainment and story. He, he wasn't writing a sermon. It's very clearly not a sermon. It's also not a novel. It's sort of in between. I really, I understand this book was incredibly popular. It was the early modern equivalent of an, a bestseller for like centuries. Um, people loved it. And I kind of, I can understand why. If you are a Christian and you uh, pick it up, it will resonate with you. At least that's the experience that I had with this reading. I'll be honest, I've read Pilgrim's Progress once or twice before, many, many moons ago, when I was a youngin in middle school, and then I've read sections of it um, to teach and things like that, and I've never really enjoyed it. I don't think it's a work that works well in pieces. I think you have to read the whole thing. It's not super long. The point is the whole journey, not just like Vanity Fair by itself. It doesn't make as much sense. It doesn't have as much of an emotional impact. And I was I was actually feeling a little snotty about reading it again. I was like, this is gonna be boring and preachy and dull and I don't wanna. And then I was just so sort of edified and encouraged and it was a week that I really, really needed a, a book like that that was um, one that would support my faith. Um, and I I sort of ended up reading it from that perspective instead of an academic perspective, which is fine. It all worked out in the end. So anyway, I highly recommend that. The other thing that I really enjoyed was a Shakespeare play. Um, I read, among many others, uh, The Merry Wives of Windsor a couple weeks ago. I don't know, I forget, it all blurs together. And this is one of Shakespeare's comedies that I hadn't read before. I didn't really know a whole lot about, and I, I really just enjoyed it. In class, we joked that this is Shakespeare's fifth best play that starts with M. And the joke, of course, is that he has five plays that have names that start with M. <laughs> so it's, it's, not, it's not his great comedy, but I just, it was really entertaining and I enjoyed it. Um, the thing that I knew about The Merry Wives of Windsor is that it was a comedy featuring John Falstaff, who was a character in the Henry IV plays, and that's kind of all I knew. Um, it's got like 17 plots, like all of the comedies do. Falstaff is trying to seduce one of two of the wives living in Windsor, and they're on to him and like not interested at all, but they decide to have some fun. And then one of the women, her husband gets wind of this, but he thinks that she's actually being seduced successfully. And then he freaks out and goes in disguise and does all this stuff. And 
then like the other couple their daughter is of marrying age and the like mistress page wants her to marry someone and mr page wants her to marry somebody else and Anne wants to marry a third guy <laughs> and it's like love rhombozoid or something and anyway it was it was just kind of ridiculous and entertaining and i really enjoyed it i would love to see a performance of this i think it would be really hilarious so if you're interested in just something sort of random and and funny uh i recommend uh, the merry wives of windsor it's also it's written almost pro, uh almost completely in prose which is very unusual for a shakespeare play and i think makes it a little bit easier to follow because you're not dealing with all of the verse so it might be a good one to read if you not as familiar with Shakespeare's comedies. Just be prepared for the million plot lines. That's how his comedies go. So two books that I am currently in the middle of and really enjoying even though I'm not reading them nearly as often as I would like. Um, the first one is Samuel Richardson's Pamela, which I've probably talked about on this channel before because I have been reading it since the beginning of the year and really I just I need to finish the darn thing because I'm getting tired of reading it even though I'm really enjoying it. It's just like it's it's a 500 page book like I should be able to have finished it in less than two months but that's life. This is not for school so it takes the back seat and it gets back seated a lot. This is the story of Pamela. She is a young woman from a kind of poor family who has wants to work as a maid for a lady and a house and the details are vague because the, it's Richardson is incredibly vague. Um, and Pamela, because of her excellent character and her talent and her cleverness, wins the kind of approval and affection of the lady who starts to train her to be um, kind of like a higher class lady's maid. Um, she gets like nicer clothing and she learns to play the piano or the harpsichord, I guess. Then the lady dies and the lady's son I think Pamela is also wonderful and beautiful and clever, um, but he doesn't want to give her really good training. He wants her to become his mistress. And Pamela's like, heck no, that is not a thing that I do. I'm not okay with doing that. And then what follows is a kind of battle of wills where he like has escalates his kind of pressure on her in various ways and she continues to resist him. And that's all I can say without being spoilery. <laughs> I make it sound really terrible. Um, he he actually like exerts pressure from a distance most of the time. Um, there's only a few instances where he's actually like in the room with her trying to get her to sleep with him. And usually when that happens, she gets so upset that she like faints and then he stops. I'm really enjoying it. I find Pamela a really interesting character. She is witty and clever and all of the wonderful things. Also, this is a very early novel. It was written in the 1740s and I'm finding that whole thing very interesting. It's epistolary, which means that it's written in a series of kind of letters slash a journal um, that Pamela is addressing to her parents, kind of keeping them updated on what's going on because she's not in the same town as they are. Her virtue gets rewarded. It does have a happy ending, um, which is not always the case for stories like these. One of the reasons that I haven't been, I have been getting through it very slowly is there was a kind of section in the middle where for about 100 pages, I was like, okay, like, <clears throat> we kept having the like Pamela tries to get away from the guy's influence and then like he he like undermines her plan and then she's stuck again and then he pushes her again and then she's like no again and like it happens like three times too many and so you I got a little tired of the cycle but then things shifted in the plot and I am once again kind of interested and engaged so if you decide to pick this up and you find yourself kind of like okay this is feeling kind of repetitive keep going um, it does change and get better um, when you get to book two so I have about 200 pages left I'm really hoping to be done with this by the end of March at the very latest um, we will see what happens the other book that I am reading and really enjoying is The Dean's Watch by Elizabeth Gouge or Gouge Gouge I don't know. The front cover says that this is a compelling saga of an unlikely friendship threaded together by redemption and grace. And honestly, that's kind of all I can tell you about it. Gooch's books aren't very plot heavy. They're more character and relationship heavy. And so it's hard to describe the, the kind of what's happening in the book 
without A being spoilery and B knowing actually what happens because <laughs> I'm, I'm not even halfway through this one. Again, I'm really just, I'm really enjoying it. I'm just um, reading so many things at the moment for school, but I can't always get to these beautiful things. But this cover is amazing and I, like I said, I'm really enjoying this. If you like sort of thoughtful contemplative books about people and relationships, um, I highly recommend reading uh, the Dean's Watch or any of Gooch's work. She's quite wonderful. And now we come to the part of the video where I talk about some books that I would like to read soon. This is not really a March TBR because am I gonna get to these books in March? I hope so, but maybe not. <laughs> So again, we will see. I actually feel like I have a little bit of extra space in March because I have spring break. So I have a little bit of extra space. I have other things that I need to be doing in, in that space, but also I think I'll have a little extra reading time. And so I'm hoping that that'll enable me to at the very least finish the two books that I am in the middle of and start these, um, if not finish them in March. So the first one I am doing for a Daniel Defoe readathon that is happening in March, April and May. I don't know if I'm going to be able to participate in April. Probably May I can participate again. This is being hosted by Miss Havisham's Clock, I think is the handle, um, Andrea over on Instagram. And if you're interested in participating in that, definitely go check it out. Um, but <clears throat> for March, they're reading Robinson Crusoe. I've been meaning to read this forever. It has been on TBRs on this channel before and I just never get around to it. I am reading two other Defoe novels actually, or Defoe books uh, <laughs> this month for school. So I figured, hey, why not just have a Defoe month and actually read Robinson Crusoe? I might actually need to read this for, um, for my final paper because it's been a hot minute since I read the book. It's not enormously long. It's only about 220 pages, um, although, the pages in the Norton's tends to be rather, like it's a very tall book, so they feel longer than normal. I am excited to dig into this one. I'm actually a little bit more motivated to read this after reading Pilgrim's Progress because I have some similar feelings about Robinson Crusoe and I'm interested now to see if my opinions about some of the things that I didn't like in the book when I read it again ages and ages ago um, will, will be different now that I'm older and more invested. If you somehow missed um, learning about what Robinson Crusoe is about. It's about a guy who gets shipwrecked on a deserted island in the Caribbean and he how he lives there for 20 years. Um, I find it really fascinating. I've been thinking about mid-century American writers recently and Walker Percy came up again. He was a mid-century American writer. Um, I think he may be Catholic although don't quote me on that. But I've been hearing good things about him for a really long time and when I was at Half Price Books today, I might have found The Movie Goer by Walker Percy, which is, it's on my 2020 classics, or my um, classics club list, and it is a book that I've been meaning to read for quite a while. So now I own it and that gives me fewer excuses to not read it. This is about a guy who lives in New Orleans and he is, soon finds himself on a search for something more important, something that will measure and mark and hold his life forever against the passage of time. Anyway, I've been hearing great things, so I would like to read it. And I'm hoping that once I finish The Dean's Watch, I can read The Movie Goer and it'll have a similar place with the sort of like contemplative novels. And then as a third sort of honorable mention, oh, I lied, I'm gonna talk about two more books. I've had a hankering to read children's books again. I don't know why, but I have. And anyway, while I was browsing Half Price Books today, I stumbled on this. It's called The Blue Umbrella. It's by Mike Mason. I've never heard of this. And this was actually, it's clearly a juvenile, it, it's like the thing says juvenile fiction fantasy, but it was in the adult fiction section. I just happened to see it. The spine stood out to me. It's so pretty. Um, I picked it up and it just sounds really fascinating. It's about a boy who, his mother is killed by lightning and he goes and lives with his two old aunts who are rather terrifying and starts to build a relationship with this person, a neighbor perhaps, I don't know, a guy named Skye. And then it turns out that there's something sort of fantastical happening and Zach has to, I don't know, do, do the things. Anyway, this sounds like a really delightful, like middle grade fantasy. And that was kind of, I'm just like, I was feeling, I was feeling it. So we're gonna read this. Um, and then finally, the last thing that I am going to read 
in March, and I will definitely be reading this, is Andrew Peterson's On the Edge of the Dark Sea of Darkness. Uh, I love this title so much. This is the first book in a four book fantasy series that was written by Andrew Peterson. It's sort of, I think, like middle grade slash young YA is, is kind of the range, although I've heard that some of the themes, in, especially in the later books, can get a little bit dark. So I think like Harry Potter age is, is sort of what you're, you're looking at. This is about the Igby children who live on the edge of the dark sea of darkness and they discover that there is more to their life than they thought um, when um, some evil creatures from across the sea come and attack their village. I have actually read this before but it's been ages and I really enjoyed it and I, then I never continued with the series for reasons? I don't know. Why don't you ever continue a series? Like it just happens. Life, life happens. So the next book is called North or Be Eaten. Um, the reason that I am reading these this month, um, hopefully I will be able to get to North or Be Eaten this month also, they're, they're not long books, is that they are being re-released in hardcover this month, the first two books of the series, uh, on March 10th, and I am um, part of the like release team, so I figured I should reread them. Um, I have the arcs of the new editions on my Kindle, they're beautiful, I mean just like this cover is fantastic. They are um, illustrated, which I think is also fantastic. I'm really excited about this and um, I'm, I've been kind of like, it's, this is one of those things that I've been like, I need, I've been meaning to come back to these for a really long time and I think this is, this is a good time to do it. There are too many books <laughs> that I am reading and have read. Um, if any of these strike your fancy, I uh, would love to hear from you. And if you've read any of these and you think that they're wonderful, I would love to hear from you. I will put a link to the pre-order for the Wing Feather books, the um, On the Edge of the Dark Sea of Darkness and North of Eaton in the description box if you're interested. Um, no pressure, but I figured that I'd mention them since they're books that I'm excited about reading. That is it for this video. Thanks so much for watching me ramble about books and I will see you in the next one. Bye!